make sure, have to make sure my technology is okay. Um, hear me okay in the back? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Father Tim, and I want to thank St. Mary's for inviting me and showing me a wonderful time around campus today. Um, I've been to San Antonio many times, um, but I've had a wonderful time today. It's always, always, always wonderful to come back to San Antonio. And you mentioned John Port, and I can't tell you how honored I am to be in the same lecture series as my good friend John Port. Um, he was, he's an extraordinary person, um, and uh, if you came tonight, you ought to come to hear Professor Buck talk as well. Uh, he's thought very, very deeply about these subjects, and I know that you're going to find his talk interesting. Now, I know from experience that one never knows how one is going to be introduced, so I always like to bring along my own introductory slide so I can tell you who I really am. Um, the, uh, that's the picture of myself that I use when I come to Texas. <laughs> Uh, not surprisingly, it's actually my wife's horse in our backyard in Massachusetts. And I try to let people know I'm a real cowboy. That's a real 10-gallon hat and cowboy boots on. And I remember uh, a number of years ago, I was giving a talk in Fort Worth. And people looked at that, and hands went up to the audience and say, that's English saddle on that horse. <laughs> so don't try to pretend that you're a cowboy or anything along those lines. Um, I'm a cell biologist, my main research tool. Um, boy, this is sort of hopping twice every time I hit it. Uh, let me go back for a second, see if this works. See if I can do it the right way. Here we go. Wow. Wow, it's, it's, it's as if every time I hit this, it's advancing twice. And that might be a problem, and I might have to switch. Um, but um, one of the reasons I'm here is because of a decision 30 years ago when a former student of mine talked me into doing something absolutely crazy which was writing a high school biology textbook. Uh, his name was Joe Levine. I thought this was a crazy idea. I said no, and eventually he talked me into it. And one of the, the prices you have to pay if you write a successful textbook is you have to keep writing them. You have to write other editions. And in science, because science is always changing, you have to do more than update it. You have to reorganize it. Um, right now, I'm writing whole new sections of our book uh, that include things like CRISPR, and epigenetic modification, and a whole host of other things. But that's also what makes uh, science exciting. Uh, I've also written uh, a number of other books for popular consumption. Um, you can see uh, three of them up here. Um, where's my AV guy? Because we're going to have to switch this. Um, because every time I push this, it's advancing twice. Um, and if we have, uh, have another controller, um, I'll tell you what. Um, and I do apologize for the technical problem here, but I always bring my own backup. <laughs> so I'm going to switch to a controller that I think will behave itself. See, this is going to be a problem because um, I'm showing some multiple slides here. But every time I push that thing, it's giving me two slides. Wait a minute. You have two transmitters. <laughs> Is that why I'm getting double? The oh. Well, why do I need two? If I may ask you. Technology is wonderful, except when it's not. Um, so I, I do apologize for that glitch. Um, I, I mentioned the textbooks. Uh, one of the reasons I know this wonderful state well is because I've been here four times for statewide textbook adoption campaigns. Um, those are exciting. Um, I'm sure you all know that the state of Texas has three official sports, and they're all blood sports. Um, and those three sports are football, politics, and textbook adoptions. So I participated at least in one of them. Um, a number of years ago, I decided, because the question kept coming up, how does one reconcile a scientific idea with evolution, uh, like evolution with faith? And my friend Francis Collins, 
who's the head of the, the Human Genome Project and now the director of the National Institutes of Health, and also an evangelical Christian, has a pat answer to that question. How do you reconcile science and faith? And Francis's answer is if two ideas are not in conflict, they have no need of reconciliation. And his view is that science and faith are not in conflict, and I will try to expand on that view tonight. Um, that idea is codified in that book called Finding Darwin's God. Just a few months ago, I published another book called The Human Instinct, How Evolution Gave Us Reason, Consciousness, and Free Will. And if you're interested in those questions, where does free will come from? Um, does, is human reason really valid? Are we genuinely conscious or are we just biological automatons? Those are the questions that I try to consider in that book. Now, obviously what I'm going to talk about tonight um, has to do with the issue of science and faith. And because of some of the text on my slides, uh, I'm going to have to stand here one or another of the screens. Uh, but I want to assure you over there that I'll get to that side too, in a certain way. Uh, in a manner of speaking. Um, this is an article that appeared in the New York Times just a couple of years ago. It was written by a very distinguished biologist at the University of Washington, David Barash. And the title, as you can see, is God, Darwin, and My Biology Class. And Professor Barash wrote the column this way. Every year around this time with the college year starting, I give my students the talk. It is not, as you might expect, about sex, but about evolution and religion and how they get along, or how they don't get along. And what Professor Barash wrote um, on this is, just as many Americans don't grasp that evolution is not merely a theory, but the underpinning of everything in biology, a substantial minority of my students are troubled to discover that their beliefs conflict with the course of the serial. And he wrote, the more we know about evolution, the more unavoidable is the conclusion that living things, including human beings, are produced by a totally natural, amoral process with no indication of a benevolent, controlling creator. And that's where I want to start from, talking about Professor Barash's argument that science and faith really are in conflict. So to answer the question, I figured I had to look up what science is. So I did, when I did that, what every single undergraduate in this room has done, whether they admit it or not, and that is I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> and science is there defined as a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. That's a pretty good definition. Um, so after doing that, I thought, okay, um, I'm also going to have to go back to Wikipedia, and I'm going to have to see what it says, not about science this time, but about religion. And in this case, Here's what Wikipedia said. Religion is an organized collection of beliefs, cultural systems, and worldviews that relate humanity to an order of existence. Well, I think that's a pretty good definition as well. And one of the things that struck me is those two definitions are not identical, but they are congruent in the sense that they fit together. And that's what I want to expand upon tonight, because both of these ways of thinking are ways of trying to grapple with the complexity of the world as we see it and with our own experience as human, being, human beings. Now, public events, like a couple years ago, there was a debate on evolution between Bill Nye, the science guy, and uh, an Australian preacher named Ken Ham, who heads the largest anti-evolution organization in the United States. It's called Answers in Genesis. These are the people who built the Ark Park in northern Tennessee, and also the Creation Museum, which is an attempt to let people know that evolution is simply wrong. And debates like this, um, I was actually asked by a number of reporters, um, do I think it's a good idea for Bill Nye to debate uh, 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 Reverend Ham? And my answer was no. And the reason for that is Ken Ham won as soon as he stepped on the stage next to Bill Nye because it gives the impression that these are two co-equal ideas anti-evolutionism and evolution itself. Now, unfortunately, that idea of conflict is everywhere. It was reinforced in 2014 with the remake of the Cosmos series. I'm old enough that I remember the original Cosmos series with Carl Sagan, which was absolutely extraordinary. Um, we have a new Carl Sagan. His name is Neil deGrasse Tyson. I can't get enough of him. I love him. I want to see him on TV even more than he already is. 
He was the host of the series. But to me, the disturbing thing is the way that remake started out. And it started out by telling the story of Giordano, Giordano Bruno. He was a 16th century Dominican. He was a philosopher and he was an astrologer. Um, and as it turns out, Bruno was condemned by church authorities. And if you look closely, and these are cartoons from the New Cosmos series, you can see how the church authorities are depicted. They're in the darkness. Their eyes are glowing. They're almost like devils. And as it turns out, Giordano Bruno was condemned by church authorities, and he was burned at the stake. Now, um, he was depicted in Cosmos as a martyr to science. Now, um, I, I have the enlightened view that nobody should be burned at the stake. Okay? But on the other hand, Giordano Bruno was not condemned for doing science. He was condemned for theological heresy. So it was a misstatement in the Cosmos series that was widely noted by historians that they depicted Mark, uh, Bruno as a martyr to science when in fact he was martyred for being a heretic and not because of his scientific work in astronomy. Nonetheless, narratives like this um, that present faith as the timeless en enemy of science and reason are everywhere. And if you're in the back and you can't quite read it, the candle burning in the darkness here is science. And there are eyes glowing in the dark saying, hit it with your Bible. And again, depicting the idea that science and faith are in conflict. And there are examples of this everywhere. This is a photograph of a sign outside a church that a friend of mine photographed and sent to me. And I can't tell you how many times I've spoken in public and I've been asked that question. If we evolved from monkeys, why are monkeys still here? And the last time I, asked, I was asked that question, um, I told the young man who asked it, I'll answer your question in a second. But first I have a question for you. Where did Protestants come from? And he was very confused and he didn't, he didn't know how to answer. And I said, but wait a minute, Martin Luther, 95 Theses, the Ref oh, he says, oh, the Reformation. Then he goes, I guess they came from Catholics. And then I said, are Catholics still here? That's the answer to why monkeys are still here. Now, we didn't come from monkeys. In fact, what evolution tells us is that we share a common ancestor with the other primates, and in fact, with all living things. That's the message of evolution. But the notion that things should evolve and then disappear, that's naive and it's incorrect. Now, this, it, these examples of conflict are pretty much everywhere. And they reinforce the science versus, versus faith stereotype. This is actually a book written at the end of the 19th century. Uh, it's a very famous book, and it made this argument that Christianity has been in an endless war with reason and science. And it still today colors a lot of the ways in which people think about this issue. Uh, the media absolutely love this stuff. Uh, a few years ago, this was the cover of Time Magazine. The cover says, God versus Science. And what this uh, issue actually had was a written debate between the British evolutionary biologist and author Richard Dawkins and the aforementioned Francis Collins, the evangelical Christian who heads up, a terrific scientist who heads up the National Institutes of Health. And if you've read this print debate, um, I think that Dr. Collins had the better of it, in part because unlike Dawkins, who's more of a popularizer, Collins actually is a working scientist and understands the mechanism, the methods, and the limitations of science, I think somewhat better than Richard does. But this conflict stereotype causes surprise in people um, when someone like Pope Francis speaks out in support of science. And just a couple of years ago, um, at the beginning of his papacy, he told a group of reporters that evolution and the Big Bang were real. Um, I was called up by both Time and Newsweek and asked for a comment on this. This is remarkable. This is astonishing. The Pope is coming out in support of evolution. And what I said to both of those magazines was this is the least surprising thing he's done in his papacy. Um, as it turns out, Time was not interested. Time wanted to find somebody who would confer that, would admit this was revolutionary. But Newsweek quoted me, and they quoted John Hawd, and they quoted Brother Guy Consolmagno, who's the head of the Vatican Observatory, of saying this is very much in the tradition of the Catholic faith. And that's important to appreciate. 
And here, the text, Pope Francis declares evolution and Big Bang Theory are real, and God is not a magician with a magic wand. He is a creator, and that is entirely different from that idea. Now, the question of God's existence, needless to say, has been thoroughly argued for centuries. And I am not going to pretend to settle that question tonight. If you'd like to, there are lots of books, <laughs> pro and con, making that argument. And I will not pretend that science can prove, or for that matter, disprove the existence of God. And I, that's sort of the premise of what I want to talk about today. But we don't have to answer that argument in order to address the issue of compatibility. And what do I mean by compatibility? Well, the answer to that is not that science proves God. I think that's a fool's errand. But rather that science and faith can coexist in peace, respecting and even supporting each other. And that's the point of view that I want to advocate for this evening. Now, I can't think of a better example of conflict than something that happened in 2004 in a small town called Dover in eastern Pennsylvania. And what happened in 2004 is the school board in that town voted for a series to establish a series of lessons on something called intelligent design for the biology classes. And they actually instructed their biology teachers. Dover's a small town. There were only four of them. They instructed their biology teachers over the summer to prepare a curriculum on this anti-evolution idea called intelligent design. Those teachers, at the risk of losing their jobs, refused. Um, the school board then, and think of a school board, a elected school board doing this. The school board then wrote a lesson on intelligent design. And they gave the written lesson to the teachers. And they said, would you at least read this to the classes? Once again, the teachers, at the risk of their jobs, refused. So the school board bought two classroom sets of an intelligent design textbook, and they sent the poor assistant superintendent of schools into the classroom one day to teach every single one of the biology classes about intelligent design. Uh, the offshoot of that was the very next day, 11 parents uh, went into federal court in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and swore out a First Amendment lawsuit complaint uh, against the school board. And they argued that intelligent design was fundamentally a religious idea, and that their rights as Americans not to have the government advocate for or against a particular religious point of view had been violated by this policy. And the Kitzmiller case, as it came to be called, fit this stereotype of conflict almost perfectly. Um, the case is called Kitzmiller after the first of the 11, first named of the 11 parents who filed the lawsuit. Tammy Kitzmiller, the unassuming woman, right in the center of that photograph in the pink sweater. Uh, the judge who heard the case was named John Jones III. You see his picture there. He's a lifelong Republican. He's a conservative jurist. And he was appointed to the bench by President George W. Bush. So you had a very conservative court uh, ready to hear this case, which initially got the advocates of intelligent design excited. Now, I'll skip to the aftermath of this. There were articles about it, once again, in Time Magazine called Evolution Wars. The New Yorker wrote a big article on the trial. Four books and two TV shows, two TV documentaries have been done on this trial. So the trial's been very, very thoroughly examined. Probably the best of them, and I think it's in my next slide, Probably the best of them was a two-hour program on NOVA called Judgment Day, about the trial and about the legal and the scientific issues. And I hope this will run okay. I want to show you a clip from the promotional video for Judgment Day to give you some idea of the issues that were involved. Oh, sorry, forgot. Um, I forgot what my next slide was. Um, that's the first afternoon of the trial. That's me. NBC TV courtroom <laughs> sketch um, being cross-examined by attorneys, and those are my textbooks scattered on the pages here, and I'm being cross-examined by this. Um, and um, I, uh, the trial began on a Monday, and my plan was I'd get there on Monday, I'd give my direct examination from our attorney in the morning, I'd be cross-examined in the afternoon, and then I'd fly home and I'd give my Tuesday 1 p.m. lecture in cell biology in my class. Well, it didn't work out that way. 
My cross-examination went on for nine and a half hours, and it lasted well into Tuesday, and for the only time in my academic career, I had to cancel the scheduled class. Um, I finished the cross-examination, hopped the plane uh, out of Harrisburg and got home, picked up my car at the airport in Providence, and I turned on National Public Radio, and they were playing a news story about the trial. And the opener of that was, it's God versus science in a Pennsylvania courtroom. And I'll tell you a little bit later why that bothered me so much and why the actual events of the trial did not amount to God versus science. But first, I think my next slide might be that video clip. Here we go. I believe there is an intelligent design in the beginning God created. Thank you if you don't believe in evolution. A small town where a civil war would have been created if there's no Russian and put science itself on trial. Very important things were at stake. One is the future of science education in this country. Nova reveals the story behind the headlines. Anywhere you turn, we were getting attacked. Witnesses uh, started dropping on the flies. And probes the question. Is intelligent design a scientific alternative to evolution? Probably the subject of science class. Or religion in disguise. It's a violation of everything we need and everything we understand as science. Judgment Day. Intelligent design on trial on NOVA. Now, I hope that narration was dramatic enough for you. <laughs> the uh, TV people absolutely love that. Um, this was an extraordinary event. The trial went on for seven weeks, and I'm sure you've all seen trials on TV. On the last day of the trial, um, the attorneys from both sides get uh, stand up and they sort of sum up their case, uh, as I'm sure you realize. Um, this is the promo uh, graphic from it. And what happened is the attorney, the opposing attorney for the school board got up, and he had one of those Dayminder calendar books in his hand, and he's leafing through it. Nobody knows what he's about to do. And then he looks up at the, the judge, and he says, Your Honor, I'm not sure if the court is aware of this, but I've been counting them. And this trial has gone on for 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> and the judge got up on his elbows, and he leaned forward with a big smile, and he said, Maybe so, but it wasn't by design. <laughs> and at that, point, at that point, we had a feeling as to how the case was going to go. Um, uh, and that's how it actually went. Now, our, the case that we made began and ended with science. Um, and this is the article in the Nature magazine after it. Um, in between the two scientists, and I was the opening witness for our case, and the closing witness was Kevin Padian, a paleontologist from Berkeley. But in between, we had a philosopher, an educational expert, and a theologian. And I should tell you, incidentally, the theologian was John Hoyt. Yeah. who will be here later on for this series. And you may want to ask John about the trial, because all of us think it was one of the most remarkable uh, experiences of our lives. And I actually, as part of my testimony, uh, basically showed slides the way that I'm doing now. And I talked to the judge about the fossil record. Uh, one of my former students, now a professor at Swarthmore, was at the trial and he was handing out little bumper stickers relating to the trial. And the bump, one of them said, we have the fossils, we win um, in the story. Um, but I also talked about things like the genetic evidence for our common ancestry with other primates. The way in which we carry around a chromosome that actually shows that we share a common ancestry with the other great apes. Uh, and also the way in which human embryology betrays the fact that we do have a common ancestry, not with other primates just, but with all vertebrates. So this was remarkable stuff. So just before Christmas in 2005, the decision was announced from that, uh, that very conservative judge. It was intelligent design is simply not science. Uh, it was front page news in everything from the New York Times to USA Today. It was the lead story on the nightly news on every single one of the networks that night. Uh, and it set off celebration in the town of Dover because after all it was 11 parents of school kids who wanted this doctrine basically out of the public education. Now I mentioned the fact that this case was often portrayed as being science against faith. 
but it wasn't a God versus science case. And I'll try to explain why. The judge himself was a Lutheran, active in his parish. Um, three of the six expert witnesses, including myself and John Hoyt, were in fact people of faith. And one was a professor of theology at Georgetown, that's Jack again. Uh, seven of the 11 plaintiffs were Christians, and two of them were actually Sunday school teachers. So the notion that this was an effort by people opposed to Christian faith to get this doctrine out of the schools, that was simply wrong. And that's an important point to make. Now, I'd love to pretend in the aftermath of that trial um, that the people opposing evolution had four weeks and all the witnesses they wanted to make their case, which they did. Um, the case simply fell apart. Everybody in the courtroom knew that this idea had no coherence, that it wasn't supported scientifically, and it was simply nonsense. Um, so I'd love to say, this is over. We don't have to talk about this anymore. But um, you live in Texas. And I know very well that we have to talk about it. Here you see some headlines. The Texas Education Board flags biology textbook over evolution concerns. These are from a couple of years ago. Evolution debate again engulfs Kef's, uh, a Texas board. This case did not settle the issue. We are still arguing about this, as everybody in Texas knows. And you might wonder, which biology textbook was it that the school board was so concerned about? Well, it was my book. <laughs> and what they did was pressure groups argued that our book contained 20 errors in our treatment of evolution. You, the good people of Texas, you don't want factual errors in your textbook. Therefore, this book shouldn't be uh, in, in Texas classes. Well, the school board eventually realized that they were not experts in science. So what they decided to do is to refer these 20 supposed errors to the biology departments at UT, at Texas A&M, and at Baylor, and ask them to rule on whether or not this was, in fact, the case. Uh, and lo and behold, they did. And they said, none of these are actual errors. This book is perfectly accurate. Um, and I have to tell you, when I went around the state in the textbook adoption campaign, I can't tell you how many textbook selection committees of independent school districts I would visit to talk about our book. And a teacher would grab me ahead of time and say, was your book the one that they made a big fuss about at the school board? And I would shrug and say, yeah, it was. And then they'd say, we want it. Um, <laughs> so that turned out to be interest, interesting. Um, and it was, in, in a way, the best free publicity we could possibly have had. Um, but it's not just Texas, and this is an art, these are some articles from last year. New wave of anti-evolution bills hitting states. Um, science bill leaves teachers' parents worried. Um, there's an alternative facts bill actually called that in South Dakota. This sparks fears about, in terms of the nature of science education. And why does this keep happening? And I think the answer to that is scientific concepts like evolution and the Big Bang and others um, are really troublesome for people of faith, particularly for Christians. And I'm going to show you a brief clip from another NOVA program from a series on evolution from 2001. And this is from the final program in the series. And it was called, What About God? As you'll see in a second. Today, even the science continues to provide evidence 
supporting the theory of evolution for millions of Americans, the most important question remains. What about God? And I think that's still true. Um, so how can people of faith reconcile them, themselves to scientific ideas such as the Big Bang? Um, and I love to show pictures like this. Um, and when I show them in front of a secular audience at my university, where people might not be familiar with what they depict, the way I describe it is, let's look over here. Um, these two people once had the equivalent of a tenured position at an Ivy League university. <laughs> And they did something terrible, so what you see is the provost over here uh, telling them that they will leave and they will spend the rest of their life as adjunct professors at the local junior college. <laughs> and then my secular colleagues at Brown, they, they can relate to that, they get that, they get that whole thing. Uh, but uh, how can you reconcile yourself that way? So here's a quiz. Who actually came up with the scientific idea of the Big Bang? Who pioneered the mathematics and the physics of cosmic expansion? And when I ask my students this, many of them say, oh, it must be Einstein, because general relativity implies that, which it does, incidentally. But the person who actually realized this first is shown in this picture right next to, oh, I'm sorry, right next to Einstein. Let me go back. Um, and you might notice he's wearing a Roman collar. Well, this is Father Georges Lemaitre who was a Belgian professor of physics and mathematics. He was one of the few people who understood general relativity when it came out. He went to Einstein and he explained, general relativity implies an expanding universe. And that means the universe is going to be bigger tomorrow than it was today. And yesterday it was smaller than it was today. And 100 years ago it was substantially smaller. And what that means is if we think backwards in time, the universe in the past was smaller and smaller and smaller, and that means it had its origin at a single point in the past. And that's today what we popularize and call the Big Bang. Uh, so Father Lamatre lived until 1966. He was not in good health towards the end of his life, but he lived long enough to see Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson in Bell Labs in New Jersey detect the background radiation left over from the Big Bang, which confirmed scientifically that he was absolutely correct. And it comes as a surprise to many people. There have been several books written about Father Lamatre, that a Catholic priest was actually the person behind what we call the Big Bang Theory. Now there's a more recent and wonderful book written by a friend of mine named John Farrell called The Day Without Yesterday. And it's about the life of Father Lamatre scientifically and spiritual. spiritual. And Lamatre was often asked, the Big Bang's not in the Bible, so how can you accept this as a person of faith? And he wrote, the writers of the Bible were illuminated more or less, some more than others, on salvation. But on other questions, they were just as wise or as ignorant as others of their generation. So it's no big deal if there are errors of scientific fact found in the Bible, especially if those errors relate to events that were not directly observed by those who wrote scripture. And one of the events that was not directly observed, of course, by the authors of scripture was the origin of the universe. And Lamatres wrote, the idea that because they were right about the doctrine of immortality and salvation, they also must be right on all other subjects, is simply the fallacy of people who have an incomplete understanding of why the Bible was given to us at all. Um, here is a paper in the United Kingdom that got Pope's comments right. His comments on the Big Bang are not revolutionary. They are, in fact, very much in keeping with the tradition that produced Lamatra. But nonetheless, evolution continues to inspire resistance from religious circles. Um, and you can see things like, was Darwin wrong? Over here, this book called The Lie. This was actually given me by one of my students not after class, but after that student saw me at Ash Wednesday services and, and said, what are you doing here? And my answer was, I'm doing the same thing you are. And she said, but you just finished a lecture on Charles Darwin and evolution. And I said, so? And she said, I'll give you a book and explain why you can't possibly be religious and accept the idea of evolution. And that, in fact, was the book. Um, and now, again, these battles continue. 
Here, for example, are some write-ups of one in New Mexico in terms of uh, New Mexico wavering on standards about evolution and climate change. Uh, and you might be surprised to see one of the leaders in favor of better science standards in the state of New Mexico. He's right here. He's got the microphone in his hands. And he is a Catholic pastor, Father Paul Chavez, who was scientifically trained before he entered the priesthood. And he came out basically in support of stronger science standards about climate change and about evolution. And happily, uh, he and New Mexico Citizens for Science won that battle. Oh, and by the way, uh, Texas this year decided to argue about it some more. Uh, so the State Board of Education is still working on this, although it looks as though they're going to make what I and most other scientists would call the right decision on this point. Now, you might wonder, what, what did Charles Darwin think about this? Um, Darwin, uh, Darwin wrote many letters, more than 4,000 of them survived. Um, and one of the most striking letters came in response to a letter from a guy named John Fordyce. And Fordyce had written Darwin, inviting Darwin to say that no person could possibly be an evolutionist and a Christian. Darwin wrote back. Darwin was unfailingly polite when he wrote people, even people he really disagreed with. But he was not polite at all with John Fordyce. And you know, look at what he wrote. He wrote, it seems to me absurd to doubt that a man may be an ardent theist and a Christian. So he called Fordyce's suggestion absurd. Darwin was not a Christian, but he thought it was absurd to think that you couldn't be a Christian and accept evolution. And he then pointed out Asa Gray, the eminent botanist. Now Asa Gray is not as famous as he should be. He was the first American scientist to accept and popularize the theory of evolution. He lectured about it all over the country. He was a professor at Harvard. He was the founder of the Arboretum at Harvard. And he was the founder of the botanical sciences in the United States. The US government published a stamp uh, in the Heroes of Science series with Asa Gray on it not too long ago. So Asa Gray should be more famous than he is. But Asa Gray, Darwin knew this, was also an elder in the Presbyterian Church. So Darwin used him as an example of someone who accepted evolution immediately and remained a religious person and a person of faith. This is Theodosius Dobzhansky. Talk to your biology professor. Dobzhansky was basically the founder of a whole field of evolutionary population genetics. Um, he was an extraordinary leader in this field. And he wrote a very famous article that we in biology love to quote just for the title. And here's the article. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And if you doubt how influential that line is, go to the great, brand new, gorgeous Life Sciences Laboratory at the University of Notre Dame. And when you walk into the hallway that opens into a large atrium, you will see those words embossed in the floor. That's how important the biology group at Notre Dame thought those words were. But I invite you to actually read the article. Here's why. Um, Obzanski wrote in the article, the diversity of life is reasonable and understandable if the creator created the living world not by caprice, I would say not by intelligent design, but by evolution propelled by natural selection. It's wrong to hold creation and evolution as mutually exclusive. I am a creationist and an evolutionist. And that's because Dobzhansky, this great evolutionary geneticist, in fact, was a, critic, was a Christian. And he wrote, evolution is God's or nature's method of creation. Creation is not something that happened in 4004 BC. It's a process that started 10 billion years ago and is still underway today. Um, what did Pope Benedict have to say about this? I quoted Pope Francis. Well, he was asked about this by a group of Italian journalists if a Catholic could believe in evolution. Uh, and what he said was, the contrast between evolution and creation is an absurdity. I like the fact he used the same word that Darwin did. Because there are many scientific tests in favor of evolution, which appears as a reality that we must see and enriches our understanding of life and being. Now, popes tend to speak in kind of complex circular language. So if you find that a little bit hard to parse, do what I do. Go to that publication that, for me, always clears up the issue of the day. And you know what that is. It's the New York Post. <laughs> Evolution and God do mix hope. <laughs> you got it.
got to love the New York Post. It always gets it right. <clears throat> well, let's step back for a second. And let's think about more than evolution. Let's think about the cosmos in which we live. And in my lifetime, one of the most extraordinary uh, events, you might say, scientifically, is the fact that we now have telescopes, like the Hubble Space Telescope, that when we train them in areas of space that used to be thought to contain cosmic haze, that haze can be resolved into millions and millions of galaxies. And everything you see here, every one of these spots is in fact a galaxy. And galaxies contain on an average 100 billion stars. So think about billions of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars. This is an incredible and extraordinary universe in which we live. Now, to me as a scientist, how do I reflect on that? Well, science is built around the understanding or the investigation of matter and energy. And I would start off, first of all, by saying life is material. This, is, by the way, is one of the few things that Madonna consistently gets right. Um, and the capacity for life is literally built in to the physics and chemistry of matter. And what that means is that evolution is an inherent and predictable part of nature. Now, if the ultimate cause of the natural world is the will of God, then evolution does nothing more than reflecting his creative power, because the capacity for evolution is built into the world he created. So in a sense, when people ask me, doesn't life have a design? My answer is yes, of course it does. It has an evolutionary design that is part of the inherent fabric of the natural world. And to me, as a biologist, that's key to my understanding. So the lesson here is the capacity for evolutionary change is built into nature, and that allows believers to see it as part of God's providential plan. Now, I'm not the only person who feels that way. Uh, this is Simon Conway Morris, a very distinguished paleontologist. He's at Cambridge University in Great Britain. He is also a Christian, one of the leading paleontologists in the world, and still a person of faith. And he's written a number of books. This is one called Life's Solutions, Inevitable Humans in a Lonely Universe, also arguing that the very nature of the created universe makes possible the emergence of human life and human intelligence. Now, many people ask me, how can we find room for God in a universe like ours? How can we find room for God in the evolutionary process? And they expect me to point to the Cambrian period or the Jurassic and say, here's something with, that God did to push along our emergence or push along the evidence of the, the process of evolution. And my answer back is, we don't have to find room for God in the evolutionary process, because if God exists, the process is part of a natural world that God made in the first place. And we should expect that natural world to be sufficient to fulfill his purposes. Now, what kind of God could exist in a scientific world in which nature acts according to predictable rules that we can study, describe, and understand? This is pretty easy. A God who fashioned a world that is both rational and intelligible. Um, so to people of faith, God is not the antithesis of scientific reason. He is best understood as the reason why science works in the first place. Um, and that's a point that I never tire of making. Now, this is my friend Richard Dawkins, and he is my friend. We are acquainted with each other. He's maybe the best and the most incisive writer on evolutionary theory today. Um, he's just retired from Oxford University. Um, he's an extraordinary guy, and he's always been very kind to me. And he's actually promoted my books in Great Britain, for which I thank him. His best-selling book of all time, however, is not a scientific book. It's an anti-theological book called The God Delusion. And one of the things that Richard wrote in one of his books was the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing, blind, pitiless indifference. Well, about 10 years ago, Richard and I, I was honored to share a platform with Richard at a, at a conference in New York University. And in a break, I reminded him of that quote and I said, Richard, you, know, you see no purpose in the universe. How do you manage to get up in the morning um, uh, with that sort of view? 
And you have to imagine this with the best Oxford English accent you can imagine. And Richard stood back and he arched his back a little bit because he's not very tall. Um, <laughs> and he said, the universe may not have a purpose, but I do. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was, I thought it, uh, I'll give you that. It was a pretty good answer. So what's the reason for that conclusion? Well, the reason he says is that the physical universe seems cold, hostile, maybe even indifferent to life. Uh, and he's sort of right about that. But here's an assertion that stuns me to come from another scientist. And that is that science alone can lead us to truth regarding the purpose of existence, which according to Dawkins is, of course, existence does not have a purpose. But science presumably can tell us that. Now the reality is that statements like that are not scientific at all. They are philosophical. That doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means they're not testable by the methods of science. And they have no more st uh, standing scientifically than a faith-based assertion that I or somebody else might know about this. And I wonder, how does Richard know the universe lacks a purpose? Because that's not a scientific idea. If I went to the cell biology meetings this year and I got up in my 15-minute talk and I said, through my work in the laboratory, I have discovered the purpose of life, people would be out in the hallway saying, come here, God, God I hear this guy Miller is losing it. Um, <laughs> because they would know that science doesn't address the issue of purpose. Um, and our purpose in evil testable scientific concepts? The answer is, of course they're not. So one of the things that has always struck me about that quote is how would somebody like John Hawke, who will come here later, how would he approach this? And I know that what Jack would do is to point out the universe has the physical and chemical potential that actually makes life possible. And he's not the only person who would feel that way. That's John right there. That's Francis Collins. And I know the late Theodosius Dobzhansky would have felt the same way. And I actually talked to Jack about this, and I said, how, how about we rewrite the Dawkins quote to also fit scientific data? And that is that the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom the wisdom of a provident and purposeful God intent upon a fruitful and dynamic world in which intelligent life could emerge. Now that's not a scientific statement, and I'd be the first one to say that. But neither was Dawkins, and both statements are consistent with what we know about science. And that's an important thing to think about and remember. Now you might know that Stephen Hawking, before his death, published a book in which he said, we know enough about the universe, to do away with the need for a creator, to do away with the first cause. Um, and this book is called The Grand Design. Um, so there's nothing special about our universe that needs explaining the values. The universe just blasted itself into existence. I don't know how many of you have read this book. It's actually a rather difficult and technical book. Um, but basically the argument is that nature has rules that allow the spontaneous creation of multiple independent universes. Universes just happen. We don't need a first cause and we don't need a creator. Now, no one has done a better job popularizing that idea, and this is the book you can read, you should read if you want a really interesting read, by my colleague Lawrence Krauss at the University of Arizona. It's called The Universe from Nothing. And he argues that we now understand enough about the creation of matter and energy to say that universes can come into existence out of nothing. Dawkins really liked that, so he wrote the afterword to Lawrence's book, and this is part of it. And he said, if Darwin was the deadliest blow to supernaturalism, a universe from nothing is the equivalent from cosmology. The title means what it says, and what it says is devastating, which is science no longer requires an explanation for the existence of the universe. Now, here's the kindest thing I can say about that argument. It's wrong. <laughs> and it's wrong, and it was pointed out, not by theists, but by philosophers who were atheists. Uh, one of whom is David Albert at Columbia, a very distinguished philosopher of science. And he wrote a devastating review of this in the New York Times. To use a vernacular, you might say he tore Krauss a new one in this review. Uh, and he pointed something out. Uh, neither of the theories that Krauss talks about, quad under N theory, can account for the mechanisms that generate these hypothetical universes. Those laws have to exist, and you still haven't explained those laws. And he says, where, for starters, are the laws of quantum mechanics supposed to come from? 
Uh, Krauss is more or less up front as not having a clue about that. And that means he really hasn't answered the question of can a universe actually come from nothing? Now, he's not the first person to point that out. Paul Davies, another cosmologist, wrote a wonderful article in the New York Times talking about taking science on faith. And he asked the question, where do the laws of physics come from? He used to ask that as a grad student working for his PhD in physics. And most often the professor would say, go away kid, you bother me. Um, or, or they would say, it's not our job to ask where the laws come from in physics, it's our job to see what they are. But Davies insight is that something outside of nature is required to explain the laws of nature. Now he doesn't necessarily mean God, but he means that nature is not self-explanatory. And he wrote that science has its own faith-based belief system. All science proceeds on the assumption that nature is ordered in a rational and intelligible way. Then he writes, clearly, religion and science are both founded on faith. The existence of something outside the universe, like an unexplained God or an unexplained set of physical laws, for that reason, both religion and science fail to provide a complete account of existence. And I would say religion and science, therefore, both need each other. Now, this idea of compatibility of science and faith was a topic just a couple of years ago at the World Science Festival. I was honored to be invited to sit on that panel, but I'm not the most interesting person on that panel, believe me. I want to show you who is, um, and that is it's uh, the guy right here in the Roman column. And this is Brother Guy Consomagno, a Jesuit and the Vatican astronomer. And he always likes to explain to people who are confused as to what a Jesuit brother means, and the Brother Guy's way of explaining it is as a Jesuit brother, it means I can hear your confession, I just can't forgive you. Um, <laughs> so that's a wonderful way of, of signing up. Um, uh, Guy Consolano is a PhD in astrophysics, and he's a very serious astronomer. Uh, he's written a number of books. My favorite among them is called God's Mechanics, and he talks about the religious beliefs of scientists and engineers. And he often, he wrote this because people were always saying, when you're looking at through your telescope, do you see God or do you see something that makes you believe in God? And he says, my belief in God is not because of what I saw in science. Rather, I believe in science because of my faith in God. And I love the way in which he turns that around. And his point is that faith validates science. And my point tonight is science is strengthened by understanding and support from people of faith. So I would go back to that New York Times column by Professor Barash, and I would begin to answer him. And he would say, evolution has demolished belief in an omnipotent and omnibenevolent God. Uh, and he wrote here, a, a purely, an entirely natural and undirected process is all that is needed in order to generate extraordinary levels of non-randomness, meaning life. Living things are wonderfully complex, but they're within the range of a statistically powerful, entirely mechanical phenomenon. And he went on to explain this to say, this is just ordinary matter. So I would ask him, is it a problem to point out that life was generated by purely natural processes? And I go back to St. Augustine. And one of the many wonderful things that Augustine wrote is this. The universe was brought into being in a less than fully formed state, something Augustine was the first to appreciate but was gifted to transform itself from unformed matter into a truly marvelous array of structure and life forms. I'm convinced that if Augustine were alive today, he'd be an evolutionist, because the idea of the uniform, uh, universe transforming itself is exactly what evolution tells us. So let's go back to Professor Barash. Uh, no supernatural trait has ever been found in us. We are perfectly good animals. Natural, indistinguishable from the rest of the living world at every level. He's right about that. But is it a problem to think that we are an ordinary part of the natural world? I remember reading a book once that said, Remember man, thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. That says exactly the same thing. We are merely made up of the materials of the earth. And by the way, in case you're looking for it, Charles Darwin did not write that book. Somebody else wrote it. That's an important thing. So the more we know of evolution, the more undeniable is the conclusion that we're produced by a natural, amoral process, no indication of a controlling creation. So 
it is true that the process of evolution does not require God as an explanation. But you can ask another question. Why should nature support the extravagant creativity of the evolutionary process? Well, I would argue that the non-theist in science has no answer. But faith can see this extravagance, and evolution is extravagant, as the work of the very same creator. So my message to Professor Barash would be skip the talk, focus on biology, and if students understand the science, they will come to their own reconciliation. So here's how I'd like to conclude tonight. These are my closing points. And I put up the cover of a wonderful book called The Sun in the Church by David Heilbrunn. And in this book, Heilbrunn points out that far from being in conflict, the principal funding agency for more than a thousand years for scientific research was in fact the church. And he uses solar observatories built into cathedrals as his example. That's what you see here on this cover. So my first point would be this, and this is important, and that is faith suffers to the extent that it rejects the gifts of understanding that science can provide. And there's nothing that disheartens me more as a Christian to see a fellow Christian rejecting science. I would argue that science suffers by means of the deep and unreasoning hostility that many of my scientific colleagues display towards scientists, towards, towards any form of faith. So I think that's unfortunate. Um, and then finally, faith and science both arise from the same human need, which is the desire to understand. Uh, nobody understood this better than Albert Einstein, himself not a person of faith, but deeply respected of the religious motivation. And Einstein wrote many wonderful things, but this is one of my favorites. It's true that scientific results are independent of religious considerations, but those individuals to whom we owe the great achievements of science were all imbued with the truly religious conviction that this universe of ours is something perfect and susceptible to the rational striving for knowledge. And every scientist I know, including myself, takes as an article of faith that the universe can be figured out. That's not something we prove from science, that's something we take on faith and that is the faith that drives science itself. So how do I want to close? And I've thought about this for a long time. So I thought um, that I would take an opinion column that appeared during the Kitts Miller trial that I was involved in. And it was written by the late Charles Krauthammer, who was probably the most conservative columnist writing for the Washington Post. And when George Will writes for the same new newspaper, you're, you're more conservative than George Will. You're a genuine conservative. So he wrote about the trial, and he wrote, phony theory, false conflict, intelligent design foolishly pits science against faith. So in that column, and boy did he know how to turn a phrase, he writes, how ridiculous to make evolution the enemy of God. And he went on, what could be more elegant, more simple, more brilliant, than a indeed more divine, than a planet with millions of life forms, distinct and yet interactive, all ultimately derived from accumulated variations in a single double-stranded molecule, pliable and fecund enough to give us mollusks and mice, Newton and Einstein, even if it also gave us the Texas <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been an honor to be here.